Hello everybody, welcome back to another quiz tutorial. In this tutorial we're going to be covering quiz number 20, which is equilibrium equations. And yes, I know, I'm a day late on this video and I, I'm really sorry about that guys. I tried to get it to you guys yesterday, but equilibrium equations, I'm not going to lie, this is a topic many students will hate. You guys will not like this because it's a bit more intuitive, it's a bit more uh, abstract, it's a little bit hard to describe, but uh, in the end it's not too bad. I hope I can clear up a lot of your guys' questions that you have with it. I know that there already has been a lot. I've received a lot of emails discussing equilibrium equations, so hopefully this can clear it up. So I didn't do the video last night because I thought, you know what, I'm a little tired. When I do this video, I need to make sure I do a good job, really try and explain it, because the better I can explain it here, the easier you guys will have with the assignment and stuff like that. And that's what I want. I want to make your guys' life nice and easy. So that's why I delayed it today. Again, I'm sorry. But hopefully after today, you guys will forgive me. <laughs> All right. So again, the topic is equilibrium equations. It's very simple theory. And the assignment, even though it's simple theory, the assignment's a little bit tougher. The quiz is a little bit tougher this week. I'm not going to lie. And this is why a lot of students will maybe get a bad impression of equilibrium equations. But I promise you, it's not too bad. So let's jump into the theory and take a look at what it has to say. All right. So the theory for this is based on two things, the balance of linear momentum and the balance of angular momentum. And as you guys will see, angular momentum, we've already kind of already used before and discussed before. You guys just haven't really known it yet. So I'm going to present you guys with three equations, because if we take a differential volume, as you guys see in Dr. Samer's videos, he did a really good job explaining, we can take a differential volume, and we're basically just taking equilibrium about the three directions. So we did some of the forces in x is equal to zero, some of the forces in y is equal to zero, and some of the forces in z is equal to zero. You guys are third year civil engineers, you guys are saying some of the forces equal to zero, that's my middle name, I know that like the back of my hand, I'm good to go. And that's all we did, and from that we were able to derive three equations. So the first one was the partial differential of sigma 1 1 with respect to x 1, plus the partial differential of sigma 2 1 with respect to x 2, plus the partial differential of sigma 3, 1 with respect to x3, plus something which I just call rho b is equal to rho a. And we're going to discuss what rho b and rho a are in a second here. And that was just if we take some of the forces about x, or the e1 direction. Similarly, we can take the sum of the forces about y and z, or the e2 and e3 direction, and we're given two more equations. So in the end, we have three equations. And as you guys know, while well, three equations, we can solve for three unknowns, not too bad. I want you guys to see in the assignments is we're going to use these three equations to solve for those unknowns. So one quick note that I'm going to make before I discuss rho b and rho a is we're so used to going horizontally across the Cauchy stress matrix. Remember if we're doing a position function or sorry, uh, yeah, if we have a position function and we want the deformation gradient or if we have displacement function and we want the displacement gradient, we take the partial differentials of the rows of our matrix C. We're so used to going, okay, well, I'd go sigma 1, 1, then sigma 1, 2, and then sigma 1, 3. Look at this equation here. As we can see, we're not going horizontally across the stress matrix. We're actually going down the stress matrix vertically. So what we're doing is we're taking sigma 1, 1, and then sigma 2, 1. So instead of going across the stress matrix, we're actually going downwards. We're differentiating the columns, not the rows. So before we uh, jump into the next slide, I also want to discuss this rho b here, which I'll probably just call rho b, these are the body forces on something. So what's an example of a body force, Clayton? Well, the best one is gravity. As you guys know, that even without me applying a force to, let's say, my desk, it's already being pulled down by gravity. So that b there, that had to be the gravity component. And of course, rho is just going to be the density of something. And of course, we know that some of the force is equal to zero in our general statics case. But if something is moving, the sum of the forces is not equal to zero. It has an acceleration component. So we have to include the rho a on this side because in the case that something is accelerating, either let's say downwards or upwards or something like that, we have to make this equal to rho a. Luckily for us in most, and I'm <laughs> highlighting that, most civil engineering applications, our sum of the forces will be equal to zero. If we're designing a building, we don't want that shit moving. We want it nice and stable, nice and static, so it's usually equal to zero. However, I have to put most scenarios because sometimes you might get surprised with something like an earthquake. In an earthquake, it accelerates the structure, and that ground movement that accelerates the structure, that actually is what causes the forces on a structure due to an earthquake. 
All right, so balance. I talked about it a lot, but in essence, it just gives us three nice equations. And as you guys will see, we're going to use these equations to start solving for unknown variables. And the second thing we're going to discuss is the balance of angular momentum. And much like linear momentum, it results in three major equations. And these equations are mind-blowing, as you guys will see. The first one, and I guess the second, third one, is sigma 1, 2 is equal to sigma 2, 1. Sigma 1, 3 is equal to sigma 3, 1. And sigma 2, 3 is equal to sigma 3, 2. Wait a second, Clayton. This, this kind of looks familiar. I've seen this before. Yes. What this says right here is these three equations is their stress tensor is symmetric. So we have nine unknown variables at the beginning. Well, we can limit that down to six because the matrix itself or the tensor will be symmetric. So nice and easy. You guys already know that it's symmetric, but the balance of angular momentum, that is the proof on why it is symmetric. All right, so that wraps up the theory. Again, not a lot to show for the theory, but the problems itself are kind of hard if you don't know how to approach them. So let's jump into the problems, and hopefully by the end you guys will say, okay, Clayton, equilibrium equations, not bad at all. All righty, guys, welcome to the quiz. Uh, just like quiz number 18, it's four questions on E-class, but I kind of split it into three questions because, again, questions three and questions four, they're the same question, just an extension of one another, if you will. But... We're going to take it one at a time, and we're going to start off with question number one, which says, if the stress state below is in equilibrium, determine the constants alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And I had to kind of put in the corner here that the body force vector is zero. So there are no body forces on here. It's just the stretch stress matrix is in equilibrium. So that means the sum of the forces must be equal to zero. So there's no acceleration or anything like that. Now, this is going to cause a lot of problems for a lot of students, because remember that when we looked at linear momentum, we had three equations, and we said, okay, well, three equations, three unknowns. But if we look into this stress matrix here, we got one, two, three, four unknowns. So we're going to actually have to use the principles of angular momentum as well, in addition to a little secret. And this little secret that I'm going to tell you guys, this will be the tricks to all these type of questions. It'll be the trick here, and it'll especially be the trick in the assignment. So as you guys will see in the assignments, you guys are going to get something very similar to this question, except uh, maybe even a little bit more challenging, if, if you will. All right. So the way that I'm going to start solving these problems and the kind of the steps that I take is I first want to write down those nice three equations that I had from linear momentum with all of the partial differential equations. And like I said before, we are so used to differentiating horizontally. So I'd go sigma 1, 1, then sigma 1, 2, and then sigma 1, 3. That is not what we do in this case. Remember, if we look at that equation, we actually differentiate vertically. So I'm going to go this way, and that'll have one equation. I'm going to go right here. This will have another equation. I'm going to go down here, and this will be another equation. Now, since the matrix is usually symmetric, it doesn't really matter. However, in this case, we can see that it doesn't really look symmetric, even though we're going to have to use the identities that it is symmetric to solve for some of these. So I'm going to go to that first equation. I'm not going to write it down. You guys can refer to your notes or something because writing down all those partial differential equations suck. But I'll say exactly what we're going to do. So I'm going to say, all right, well, from equation one, and this is the partial differential of sigma one, one, dot, 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 like all those ones. So from equation one, what we're doing is we're going to take that first term in the column and differentiate with respect to x1. So the differential of 2 with respect to x1, well, that's going to be 0. Because yeah, derivative of 2, well, that's just a constant. It's going to be 0. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to the next value in the list, which is this one right here. And I'm differentiating this one with respect to x2. So alpha x2 differentiated with respect to x2, well, that's just going to give me alpha. So I'm going to have plus alpha. And I'm going to come down to the next entry on the list, which is delta x3. And I'm differentiating that third component by x3, so what I'll get is plus delta. Because if I differentiate delta x3 with respect to x3, I'm just going to end up getting delta. The next component in the equation is the body forces. But over here, we're actually told that these body forces are equal to 0. So this will be plus 0. And then this whole thing is equal to 0. And the reason why we say it's equal to 0 instead of row A has to do to this fact right here, where it's in equilibrium. So if you see equilibrium, static equilibrium, something like that, it means that the sum of the forces is equal to zero. So therefore, we're left with this. Now, we can't really get a lot from this equation, because the only thing that we can really conclude from equation one is that alpha is going to be equal to negative delta. 
But other than that, we don't really have anything at all. So we say, okay, well, maybe equation two will tell us something. So I'm going to erase all that first part. And I'm going to go to equation two. So equation two focuses on the second column of the stress matrix. So I'm going to go equation two. I'm going to look at the first component right here. And remember, the first component we always differentiate with respect to x1. So I'm differentiating beta x2 with respect to x1. And you guys are saying, wait, well, I'm differentiating with respect to x1, but I have no x1. So therefore, this first component is actually 0. I go down to the second component, which is 0. Well, we know that the derivative of 0 is going to be 0. doesn't matter what we're differentiating to. And finally, that third component, 2, is also a 0. So we're going to have plus 0. Remember, we have no body forces, so this will be plus 0. And this is equal to 0 because it's in equilibrium. So what this equation basically tells us is that 0 is equal to 0. So that was useless, <laughs> completely useless. You're saying, OK, well, now I'm getting a little bit scared because so far I only have one equation, but I have four unknowns. So let's go to the last one and maybe that'll tell us something. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to say equation three, which focuses on the third column of the stress matrix. So equation three, look up and say, OK, well, my first component is going to be that gamma X2. Remember, the first component I always differentiate with respect to X1. Well, the differential of gamma x2 with respect to x1, well, there's no x1. This is also going to be absolutely nothing. This can be 0. And then the next two, as we can see, are 0 and 0. So this equation is going to be 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus the body force. Oh, wait, that's also 0. Is equal to the density times acceleration. Well, oh, wait a second. That's also equal to 0. So this equation is also very intuitive, where it concludes that 0 is equal to 0. So this is where students start freaking out when we start talking about equilibrium equations, because even though we give you guys three equations, the expectation is, OK, well, they give us three equations. They're always going to give us three unknowns and it's going to be nice and easy. However, that's not the case. As we can see here, we have four unknowns, but we only really have one useful equation that comes from equation one. So now we're going to have to start talking about the principles of angular momentum, angular momentum. So what does that mean? Well, that means that sigma one, two is equal to sigma 2, 1. So basically, this means that the matrix is symmetric. So if I come up here and say, OK, well, my sigma 1, 2 is beta x2, and my sigma 2, 1 is alpha x2. And then that's when I can start saying, oh, wait a second. This looks familiar. This looks like something I can try and equate and make something special out of. So I come down here, and I can say, OK, well, that means that beta x2 is going to be equal to, and I come up here, uh, alpha x2. So this is equal to alpha x2. And therefore, we can conclude that alpha must be equal to beta. So I'm going to highlight the kind of the identities that we already have. So we have alpha is equal to negative delta. And we also know that alpha is equal to beta. So if I figure out one of these alpha, beta, or delta, I solve for the rest really simply. But the problem is, is we haven't really solved for anything so far. We have a bunch of identities, such as alpha is equal to beta, but we don't really have alpha is equal to a number yet. So let's move on and say, OK, well, sigma 1, 2 is equal to sigma 2, 1. Our next one is going to be sigma 1, 3 is equal to sigma 3, 1. So we come up here and say, OK, well, what are those components? I look at sigma 1, 3, which is gamma x2. So I'm going to come down here and say, all right, so this means that gamma x2 is going to be equal to sigma 3, 1, which is delta x3. So I'm going to come down here and say this is equal to delta x3. Now, this is where you guys are going to have to utilize that special trick that I mentioned. So the special trick is that this equation always has to be satisfied no matter the coordinate points. No matter the coordinate points. So the key to these questions are subbing in coordinate points to try and figure out the relationship. So if I want to, let's say that I want x2 is equal to 1 and x3 is equal to 0. This is a valid coordinate point, and this equation must hold. So if I look at this, I can say, OK, well, it's going to be gamma times x2, which is 1, is equal to to delta times x3. Oh, wait, x3 is 0. So therefore, gamma multiplied by 1 is equal to 0. So from this, I can conclude that my gamma must be equal to 0. And I'm going to highlight that because there is my first kind of identity. 
Because if we look up here, oh wait, <laughs> we don't, we're not quite there yet. Almost. Almost there, guys. <laughs> so if we do the opposite thing where I go, okay, well, how about when x2 is equal to 0 and x3 is equal to 1? And I'm just going to put an arrow sign up here, an arrow sign over here. Well, this means that I have gamma times 0 is equal to delta times 1. Oh, wait a second. That just means that delta is equal to 0. So my delta is equal to 0. So therefore, I already have two of the components. Now I can scroll up and say, oh wait, now that I know delta is equal to zero, I had a relationship between alpha and delta. And I'll switch colors here so I can really show you guys. And that's this one right over here. So if alpha is equal to negative delta and delta is equal to zero, I can come down here and say, okay, well, from that relationship, I can also say that alpha is equal to zero. So now I already have three out of the four components looking pretty good. And I say, oh, wait a second, I had a relationship between alpha and beta here for you guys. And that's this one right here where I found that alpha is actually equal to beta. Well, if alpha is equal to zero, that means that beta is all also equal to zero. So I come down here and I say, all right, well, beta is equal to zero. I'm going to highlight this and I look and say, oh, wait a second. I already have my four components. Gamma is zero, delta is zero, alpha is zero, and beta is zero. So again, the trick here is that when you guys are stuck and you guys have more variables than equations, stuff like that, the key in the key is to sub in coordinate points because it must be valid for every coordinate point. If I wanted to, I could have done x1 is equal to zero and x sorry, x2 is equal to zero and x3 is equal to zero, but that would just give me zero is equal to zero. If I wanted to, I could have had x3 is equal to 60 and x1 is equal to 50. But again, that wouldn't tell us anything. That's why it's always nice to put one of them equal to zero, because then I can solve for the other variable. Nice and easy. So I hope that cleared up question one. Again, the trick here is that it's valid for any coordinates. So just sub in coordinates so we can find the answers nice and easily. We're going to come down here to the next question. And it's very similar, just a little bit different. It says, if the stress state shown below is in equilibrium, determine the body force factor. So remember that before, and I'm just going to switch colors here, before we had that rho b, which is the body force factor, is equal to zero. So in all of our equations, we always had plus zero at the end of them. Now we're saying, okay, wait a second. This isn't true. That rho b does not equal zero. What is rho b? So what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing before. We're going to go through our three equations, and we're going to make them equal to zero. Now, the nice thing is whenever you're solving for a body force vector, you only need those three equations because the vector itself has three components. We have three equations, three unknowns, nice and easy. So again, when we're going through the three equations, we're differentiating vertically. So I'm just going to highlight the vertical component here and I say, OK, well, let's start with equation one. So I'm just going to go equation one. As you guys know from the formula sheet, you guys know what this is. So we're going to take the first component, which is 5x1. And we're differentiating the first component with respect to x1. Well, this will just give us 5. We move on. We say, okay, well, we're going to take the second component, which is 3x2. And we differentiate that with respect to x2. We're going to get 3. And then finally, we go on to the last component, which is x3. We differentiate that third component with respect to x3. This will just be equal to 1. Now, the trick is, is remember, at the end of this equation, we always had the body force vector. And before it was zero, but now it's not zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put rho b1. That's our unknown that we're trying to solve for. And this is in equilibrium. The question says it uh, explicitly right here. It's in equilibrium. When you guys see that, you say, okay, well, that means that there is no acceleration. So this side is equal to zero. And if I look at this and I say, okay, well, I have one equation. I only have one unknown. I can very quickly see that my rho b1, so one, is equal to negative 9. So that wasn't so bad. And all we have to do is repeat this process with the remaining three columns. So I'm going to erase this so we <laughs> avoid as much confusion as possible. So for equation 2, we're looking at that second column, which will be this right here. And I'm just going to go through and start differentiating everything with respect to all of those special x's. So equation 2, we look at the first component, which is 3x2. But remember, we always differentiate that first component with respect to x1. Well, we don't have an x1 in the first component. We have an x2. So this first component 
is actually going to be zero. Because again, we're differentiating with respect to x1, and there is no x1 in that equation. Now we move on to the second component, which is 3x1. But this time, remember, the second component we differentiate with respect to x2. And there is no x2 in this equation. So we're going to have plus zero as well, because again, we're differentiating with respect to x2, and there is no x2. The third component is very trivial. We're differentiating with respect to x3, but it's zero. So anything, the derivative of zero, Derivative of zero is always going to be zero, no matter what we differentiate to. So we're just going to have zero and plus the body force vector two. And this is equal to zero. So from here, it's very nice and easy to see that my row B2 is equal to zero. And I'll highlight these so we can actually kind of keep track a little bit. So row B1 is equal to negative nine. Row B2 is equal to zero. We come down and see up. We know that we have a third equation, which I'm just going to call equation three, and we're just going to start differentiating the shit out of it. So let me just erase this so that uh, there's no confusion. I'm going to highlight this. So remember, the third equation deals with the third column. The first uh, entry, we always differentiate with respect to x1. There is no x1. We have an x3. So this first one is actually just going to be zero because, again, we don't have an x1. We look at the second and the third one. Well, they're both zeros, so it's very trivial that this is just going to be zero plus zero, plus zero, and then plus row B3. So row B3, and this is equal to zero because it's in, e in equilibrium. And we can see really quickly that row B3 is actually equal to zero as well. So in conclusion, we can say that, all right, well, our row B, our vector, and I'll put this in the actual vector form, so it actually, it looks uh, nice and fancy, is equal to negative nine, zero, and zero. So solving for these body force vectors, it's very simple because they appear once in each one of the equations, and we have the equation equal to something, so it's just solving one equation at a time. We go through all three. This shouldn't be a problem for you guys. You guys will be experts at this in no time. So that is question number two. Let's move on to question number three. And question number three is what you guys will all hate and probably send me a ton of emails about. So hopefully I can explain it nice and easy that the secret to it is we're going to have to use Mathematica. So this tutorial will stop on the iPad and transform over to Mathematica, but let's figure out why do we need Mathematica. So question three says the beam below is subjected to zero body forces. Well, that's nice. And a horizontal force P. If sigma 1, 1 is the only non-zero stress component, determine A, the differential equation of equilibrium. Oh, differential equation. That sounds like garbage. Trust me, it is hot garbage. That's why we'll need Mathematica and b, sigma 1, 1 as a function of the position. So I want a nice equation for sigma 1, 1 that I can just say, okay, well, if I am interested in x is equal to 2, what is sigma 1, 1? Stuff like that. So if we look at the beam, it's not too bad. It has a constant in-plane depth of 1. So that's what b usually is, is the in-plane depth. It's 1, it's constant. But the height varies over the length. As we can see for the height of the beam, we're given an equation 4 minus x1 squared divided by 50. Now, the assumptions in this, as Dr. Samer already kind of explained to you guys, but I want to explain it again, these assumptions are very, very, <laughs> I don't even know how to say it. Uh, what, would, what would be the best word? Uh, extreme assumptions, if you will. Uh, the chances are sigma 1, 1 being the only non-zero stress component, well, it's going to be impossible due to effects like Poisson's ratio, stuff like this. So this makes for a nice uh, theoretical problem, but in the real world, these assumptions would never hold up. I just wanted to <laughs> kind of throw that in there. All right, so what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to solve part A using our actual iPad, using theory, stuff like that. But solving the differential equation, part B, that's what we'll do in Mathematica. And yes, this is what I expect on your assignment. So on your assignment, you guys are going to have something similar to this. I'm not going to lie. But what should what you guys should do, find the differential equation. Once you guys have it, throw, on, throw it into Mathematica to solve it. It's actually not too bad if you guys have the differential equation and know how to solve differential equations using Mathematica. So it won't be that bad. Let's go through part A. So the secret to finding this differential equation is by taking a small slice of this beam. So what I can do is I can say, okay, well, I'm interested in a tiny little sliver of this beam. Let's say this, and this has length dx. So this is what we call an infinitesimal slice. It's very tiny, even though it looks like it's 
I don't know, 5% of the beam in this picture, this is actually a very, very tiny little piece. And what we see is the width of this piece is we're going to call it dx. Now, a couple little things I'm just going to clear up really quick. In the equations, we're going to have sigma 1, 1, and we're going to have big X 1. Well, we're only looking at one direction, so instead of having the 1, 1 on the sigma and the 1 on the x, I'm just going to have big X, and I'm just going to put sigma by itself because, again, we're only looking at the one direction. It's not going to be anything too crazy. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that little sliver, and we're going to blow it up in the sense that it's going to now become a free body diagram. So I'm just going to come down here and say, all right, well, my sliver is actually going to look something like this. So if we magnify it, we're going to say it's going to look something like this. And what I'm going to do simply is I'm just going to put all the forces onto this diagram. So I'm going to say, OK, well, I'm going to have sigma and actually I'll change colors to really highlight. It. I'm going to have sigma one one coming out this way. And again, it's sigma one ones are our only stress we're concerned about. So I'm just going to put sigma and then going the other way. We have sigma plus the change in sigma. So we're going to have sigma plus the change in sigma over the change and x because again we're moving from one point to another the stress isn't always just going to be the same and let me just make this a little bit more clear here at the bottom this length right here this is dx so this is what we have and it's nothing too crazy it's nothing too special and we're saying okay well we have sigma on one side on the other side we have sigma plus the change in sigma all right sounds simple enough clayton uh, where's the real trick to this? Well, keep in mind that all we're going to do is some of the forces has to be equal to zero. Remember, this thing is in equilibrium. This thing is not accelerating anything crazy. So I'm going to just go simply this. Oops, I, <laughs> I held it for too long. The sum of the forces is equal to zero. Now, the key here is the sum of the forces is equal to zero, not the sum of the stresses. The sum of the forces is equal to zero. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to convert both of these into forces. Well, remember that we can very quickly go from force to stress based on whatever the area is. So we're going to have to define two areas. So on this side, it's going to be area plus the change in area over the change in X. And on this side, we're just going to simply have the area and I should have wrote them backwards. I probably just made this really confusing. So that area that I just highlighted on the one side, that's going to be kind of this right here. And then, of course, as we start moving along the beam, the area changes. So this is going to be the area plus the change in the area. So it's as simple as that. We can go through the equation now. Just start writing the forces. So the first thing that we have to keep in mind is, OK, well, Stress is equal to force divided by area. So therefore, if I want force, this is just simply going to be the stress times the area. It's as simple as that. So I just come down here and I say, OK, well, let's just write down our forces. So on the left side, and I'll highlight it, we just simply have sigma. So I'm going to switch to pink. So I'm come down here. I'm going to have sigma times A. And this force is pointing left. So I'm just going to throw a negative in there for fun. And that's all we have on the left side. Oh, well, that doesn't seem too bad, Clayton. What about the other side? Well, the other side, so we're going to have plus because the force is going to the right. We're going to have this stress right here, which is sigma plus the change in sigma over the change in x. Plus the change in sigma over the change in x. And we have to multiply this by the area. So I'm going to come over here, and I actually should have included both of these. Whenever we have a dx, we need to put dx here. And I'm sorry I didn't include it. It's because we don't really use it later, as you guys will see. So let me just erase this. I'm probably confusing a lot of you guys. I'm sorry. So remember, we need that dx. And this dx that I just put in right here and right here, this is this dx on the bottom. That's not a differential. That's kind of the width there. So what I'm going to do is unhighlight those. Say, OK, well, now I got the chain. We have sigma plus the change in sigma dx times dx. And then we multiply this by the area. So I come up here and say, all right, well, my area is going to be the area plus the change in area over the change in length times dx. So this will be area plus the change in area over the change in x dx. 
And we say, okay, well, that's it for the right side. There's no other forces. And so this thing's in equilibrium. So this is just equal to zero. So now we're looking at this and saying, well, this looks kind of funky because I got a bunch of sigmas. I got area areas. And I got some X's. But where, where the hell does P appear? If we look at this thing, the whole deformation is caused by this P right here. And that doesn't appear once in my equation. So this is what will start throwing a lot of students off. They don't have P in their equation. They're going to start freaking out. Now, what a lot of students will try and do, and I'll switch to blue here to really show what they try and do. Please don't do this. Is they'll put P right here. They'll say, all right, well, P must be right here. And then I'm going to include P in my sum of the forces. No, don't do that. Because we're not looking at the very end. We're looking in the middle of the beam. When P is going to actually appear is in our differential equation. Because if you guys remember, differential equations, they need a boundary condition to solve for them. We need to say, at this point, the stress is equal to this. Something like that. Right now, we're just creating a differential equation. But in order to solve for it, that's when we're going to actually need P. If we don't have those boundary conditions, remember, our differential equations will just have a ton of constants in them. In order to get rid of those constants and replace them with values, that's when we use boundary conditions such as, oh, at this end of the beam, the stress is going to be equal to P divided by the area, something like that. So let's just look at our differential equation right now and say, OK, well, this is kind of uh, gross. So let's expand this out a bit. So the first part, and I guess I'll switch back to pink, is negative sigma times A. Well, that's not too bad. I'm just going to leave it. And I'm going to say, all right, well, plus, and my first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this sigma multiply it by this a over here. So what I'm going to have is sigma times a and oh, wait a second, those two are going to cancel. So I'll save that little bit for fun for a little bit later. So now we're going to go plus now I'm going to take that sigma, I'm going to apply it to the far side all the way over here. And you guys are going to get sick of me watch sick of watching me change colors. So now this is going to be sigma times the change in area divided by the change in x times dx. All right, so not too bad. Well, now that I'm done with sigma, I'm going to move on to the second term, which is that change in stress divided by dx. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this term, multiply it into the area. So this is going to be plus the area times the change in sigma over the change in x dx. And then finally, I'm just going to repeat this one more time by taking the change in stress and we're multiplying this all the way to the other side to the change in area so this is going to be something where that'll mess up a lot of students uh doing it for the first time so this can be change in sigma divided by the change in x times the change in area divided by the change in x or i guess not divided by with respect to and then we have dx squared all right so now looking at this equation it looks pretty gross but a lot of simplification can happen so i'm going to switch to my green simplification well we have negative sigma a plus sigma a so of course these are going to cancel no worries about that you guys can see that that's not bad and the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to actually cancel this last component you're saying wait a second clayton how are you canceling that well you're breaking all the rules here settle down well no it's because of this right here so keep in mind that that dx that was like it's an infinitesimal. It's disgustingly small. It's tiny, 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 tiny. And if we square it, it's going to get even tinier, exponentially tinier. So this term right here, this is negligible. This is basically just saying zero. So what we have left in terms of actual meaningful components are going to be these two right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here and say, OK, well, now I have sigma times the change in area divided by the change in x plus, oops, and I forgot something, sorry, times dx. And then we plus the area times the change in stress with respect to the change in x times dx is equal to zero. I say, OK, well, it's still not exactly where I want it to be, but we're getting close. We're getting close. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually factor out this dx. So this is how we get rid of the dx. We factor it out. So I come down here and I can say, all right, now I got sigma times the multiplied by the change in area with respect to x plus the area with the change in stress with respect to x. And then this will all be in nice big brackets. 
and we factor out that dx, and this is going to be equal to 0. Well, what I can do is I can move dx to the other side, and when I do that, it's very easy to see, well, 0 times dx, that's just going to be 0, so I can cancel this, and my differential equation is going to be this right here is equal to 0. So I'm going to come down here and say, all right, so sigma times the change in area divided by the change in x plus a times the change in sigma with respect to the change in x is equal to zero. So that's our differential equation. I'm, and for any case, this will work. This is our differential equation where we did, we, we've conducted all the hard work. Now what we're going to do is say, okay, well, if I look at what the multiple choice gave me in the exam, it didn't give me a's, no a's. And the reason why is we already know the formula for the area. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this component and we know this component, we're going to substitute it in. So remember from above that area was equal to four minus x squared divided by 50. Well, that's just a function of x. So what I can do is I can take the derivative of a with respect to x and say, okay, well, the derivative of four, that's going to be zero. The derivative of negative x squared divided by 50, well, this is going to be negative 2x divided by 50, which is simply equal to negative x divided by 25. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, well, now I know these. So I'm going to substitute this value over into here. And I'm going to substitute this value over into here. So this is kind of the trick is we find the differential equation. And we always know the area function, so then we're just going to substitute all of those into there. So in the end, and I'm going to try and make this look as, as pretty as possible, it, what we're going to have in the end is that sigma multiplied by the change in area over the change in x, which we now know is just negative x divided by 25. And we go plus the area, which we know is 4 minus x squared divided by 50, multiplied by the change in x, or I guess the change in x, the change in sigma, come on, the change in sigma over the change in x, and I was about to do a small x, is equal to zero. So this is actually our final differential equation. As we can see, the next step, which would have been part B, or question four for you guys, is now we're saying, okay, well, how exactly do we solve this problem? If it was just sigma by itself, you guys would laugh at me and say, oh, Clayton, this is no problem at all. But this right here, the change in sigma over change in x with respect to x, this is what causes all the problems. It's a, Now it's a differential equation. It's not just a simple function. This is when we're going to jump over to Mathematica. So what I'm going to do is that we're going to hop on over to Mathematica, and we're going to solve it using Mathematica. So I hope this helped for questions one through three, and then I hope that Mathematica tutorial will help with the remainder of question four. All right, guys, I'll see you in Mathematica. All righty, guys, welcome to Mathematica. I know you guys are probably sick of the transitions by now, but I promise you this is the last one. By the end of our little Mathematica journey here, we'll be all done the quiz. Uh, they, they seem to get beefier as they go. <laughs> the last quiz gave me hope that they were getting a little bit shorter, but... Uh, <laughs> I was proven wrong, I guess. So if we look at Mathematica here, I have three sections that I defined. And I recommend that you guys use these sort of sections when you guys are doing the assignment as well. So I defined the variables. We already know that P is equal to 1, L is equal to 4, and then we're given the area function, which I simply just typed in as the area function. If I were to run it by pressing Shift-Enter, as you guys can see down below, it gives us 4 minus x squared divided by 50. And again, that was something that we were given. Now. The whole goal of using Mathematica is to solve this differential equation, which I also have on the screen right there. So the question is, how do we do that in Mathematica? Well, there's a bunch of different ways, really, but I have my own personal way, and you guys can follow along and do it my way if you guys like. I hope it helps somewhat. So the first thing I like to do is I like to have a little list of everything that I needed uh, for my differential equation. So if I look at the differential equation, it's sigma. Well, I'm trying to solve for sigma. Area. Well, I've already had the area defined up here. I have the change in sigma with respect to x. Well, again, that's something I'm trying to solve for. But then I also have the change in area with respect to x. And I can actually solve for that 
independence of the differential equation. So when I put this little section, solve for needed variables, one of the variables I'm going to include is I'm going to call it dA, which is the differential of A with respect to X. So remember, in order to do a differential with respect to something, I use the capital D function. So since it's a function, I do those nice square brackets, and that D basically just means differentiate. So there's going to take in two inputs. The first one is my function. Well, my function is simply A, and I have it defined above. And then the second thing I would need to define is what I want to differentiate with respect to. Well, of course, that's going to be with respect to X, so I'm just going to put X there. It should be good to go, so I'm going to suppress the first one so we can see our answer. And if I go Shift Enter, Shift Enter, I get negative x divided by 25. As you guys remember from the hand calculations, that's exactly what we got before. So there's no, uh, nothing crazy going on here. So if I look at my differential equation right now, I have everything that I need to go ahead and solve for it. So in order to do that, I'm going to come down to this section, which is solve the differential equation. And the Mathematica command when solving differential equations is called dsolve. So capital D, capital S, and then finish off the solve, and square brackets. So unlike the differenti differentiate command above, what we're actually going to do is we're going to need three input arguments. So I'm going to have two commas. I'm going to have one input argument here, one input argument here, and the finally the last one over here. So the first input argument, of course, is going to be our differential equation. So as we can see down below, we have our nice differential equation. So we're going to have sigma x. So I'm just going to put this as S11 of x. So we don't know what that is. That's why it's blue in this equation. It's because the mathematics is saying, wait a second, you didn't define sigma11 of x. So I'm saying sigma11 of x. And then this is multiplied by dA. And then the second part of the differential equation was the change in sigma11 with respect to x. So I'm going to go S11 of x again. But remember, this is the derivative. This isn't just sigma11. So in order to put that into this equation, I put a prime there. So I will go sigma 1, 1 prime of x. And this one right here, this was multiplied by the area. So I'm not sure if I did it exactly as I wrote it down on the side of the screen here, but this is in essence our differential equation. It's going to be sigma times dA plus d sigma times A. And all this is equal to 0. So we have to put what it's equal to. So this whole differential equation it's going to be equal to zero. The second argument that we're going to put in this d-solve is we're going to say, okay, well, what equation are we solving for? Well, in this case, we want sigma 1, 1 of x. So this is perfect because we're looking and saying, okay, well, we don't know sigma 1, 1 of x. Well, now I'm saying this is what I'm trying to solve for. Mathematics goes, oh, okay, Clayton, that's what you're trying to do. I understand now, or somewhat. Final argument is what is the differential variable? Well, in this case, we know it's just going to be x. So the last two inputs into this desolve function, they're not bad at all. The hard part is just putting in, in the differential equation itself. Uh, what a lot of students will mess up on is this kind of prime here. So remember, the whole thing that the reason why this is so hard is it's a differential equation. It has derivatives inside of it. How do I do that in Mathematica? Well, I just put the nice little prime there. So if I run this, and I'm going to actually suppress dA. If I run this, I go... Oh, perfect. It didn't give me an error, but what the hell is up top there? C1? What, what is C1? I see the bottom is negative 200 plus x squared, and I, I look at the multiple choice answers, and I'm thinking, oh, well, <laughs> that's not too bad because I'm on the right track, but what is C1? So remember before I said our differential equation had nothing to do with P inside of it, which is funny because the mechanics of that whole beam are dependent on that P. Well, remember when we're solving differential equations, we're always going to end up with constants. And the way to solve for those constants is by typing in the boundary conditions. So I need to say, okay, well, the stress at this end of the beam is going to be this. And using that condition, it can actually solve for the constants. And we can do that in Mathematica right here too. So what we're going to do is we're going to define the boundary condition at x is equal to L, or that right-hand side of the beam. Because we know the area at that side of the beam and we know what P is at that side of the beam. And if we know, of course, the force P and the area, we can find the stress at that side of the beam. So under my needed variables, I'm going to add a new one, which is S11 at the end of the beam. So I would just put S11 end. It doesn't matter what you guys really put for it. And we know that this is going to be our force P divided by the area. Now, 
since the area is a function of x, we have to specify the area when. So remember, when is that backslash period? And I'm going to put in brackets when x approaches l. So now I'm going to suppress the differential equation so that doesn't pop up. If I go uh, S11 at the end, I get 25 divided by 92. That is the amount of stress at that end of the beam due to P. So again, I just took my uh, force P and I divided by the area. And I just put when the area is at L. Because remember, that area changes over the length of the beam. So now that I have this boundary condition, I know that my sigma 11 at L is equal to the sigma 11 at the end. I can actually incorporate that into the desolve function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that first input and I'm going to put square brackets around it. So starting from sigma 11 of x all the way to the equal equal zero sign, I basically just put those squiggle brackets around my differential equation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a comma and I'm going to say that S11 at L, so here's the thing, I'm putting S11 at L is equal to, and I know it's S11 end. So I'm just adding in this right here, which is my boundary condition, saying that the stress at the end of the beam is equal to this value. Now, if I run this differential equation again, oops, I, I <laughs> didn't suppress it. Let me just unsuppress it. If I run it again, I get my S11 as a function of x, which is exactly what the question's wanting, is negative 50 divided by negative 200 plus x squared. And that's one of the options, and that's actually the correct answer. So that's it. That's all. This is how you do it. Not bad at all. The trick here is incorporating that boundary condition. After that, you guys will all be fine. You guys are smarter than me. It should be good to go. So that concludes quiz number 20. I can't believe we've already done 20 quizzes so far. But yes, this concludes quiz number 20. Thank you guys all so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in quiz number 21, which is a really fun quiz.